Good morning, Winchester Public Library. Is anybody out there today? It's Erin, checking in on a Monday morning. Happy Monday. Um, I found myself a little bright nook of the library today. Um, far away from everybody, I think. And it's very beautiful in here. It's very quiet. Um, I am joining you today to talk books. I hope everybody had a nice long weekend. Um, I finally had to uh, bite the bullet this weekend and cut my own hair because I just can't go on forever, right? That my hair doesn't get cut. So I did, um, didn't give myself bangs. I knew that was not gonna be a good idea. Uh, but I did have to cut my own hair. That's the point that we're at. Um, I am here to chat with you today about um, food memoirs. Um, I don't think anybody's joined us. Um, but that's all right. We can catch you can catch this later on uh, on our Facebook page and on our YouTube page, and it'll be here on Instagram for you know in perpetuity. Um, so I wanted to talk about food memoirs because I personally love food memoirs. And you might be asking yourself, what is a food memoir? Um, it's a fair enough question. It's not a memoir by food, written by a piece of food, which is what my son thought when I told him. Um, a food memoir is a memoir written by somebody about their experience, but the theme of the book or the glue that holds the book together is food, to be table. Um, and in the age of the celebrity chef, which is probably became popular in the 90s when um, people knew chefs more, chefs were in the press, um, cooking shows started, uh, we started to see a lot more food memoirs. And we saw them from very famous chefs. Um, I have a couple here. Um, and then it's not just chefs that write food memoirs, but that's sort of getting into this discussion. We can talk about chefs like, um, you know, the very famous chefs, Anthony Bourdain, Martha Stewart, um, Ina Garten, all of the people who you might know from the Food Network have written cookbooks mainly, but some of them have also gone into memoir. And they've told the story of their life growing up or their life as a chef or their life traveling the world, and the stories that they collect and tell to us are about food and how the food of their childhood or their family or their travels um, or their work has created um, a thread, a narrative through which we read their story. So the story is about um, people or a workplace or an industry, but the anchor keeps coming back to food. And I have some examples for you. I don't know if I can fill 25 minutes of examples with um, food memoir, but if not, we'll move on to talk about the calendar this week. Um, this weekend I read, I'll start with the one that I just read this weekend because it's a great book. Um, it's called Save Me the Plums by Ruth Reichel. Ruth Rachel was a, the editor of, um, you might know her mainly as the editor of Gourmet Mag Magazine. She was the editor from starting in about um, 1999 to 2009, about 10 years, right up until the magazine closed actually during a recession. Um, she previously is a food writer. She also was the restaurant critic for the New York Times for a long time, um, five years I think. Uh, which is another interesting part of food memoir if you think about um, there are books and I think she she has about five memoirs I think and I think one of them is from a chunk of time when she was doing that work or written after talking about going into restaurants where nobody's supposed to know you she was eating um, eating out 16 times a week if you can imagine that uh, and having to write and report back on all of these meals um, but save me the plums is a book about her time as she leaves her job at the New York Times as the food critic, as a restaurant critic, and takes the job editing 
Gourmet Magazine. And the trials and tribulations of running a magazine when you have no experience, um, trying to turn the magazine, which at that time was already for almost 50 years old, the magazine opened in 1941, and it had a very staid readership for a very long time. Um, but people were changing, and food was changing, and um, celebrity chefs were coming, restaurants were changing, um, people had varying degrees of income and could no longer necessarily afford um, the kind of food that maybe the gourmet magazine um, was or targeting for their audience. So they, she worked hard to sort of turn the magazine into something that was accessible and fun and new. Um, while still staying true to it being um, really the first Epicurean magazine. And the story is fun because she becomes a, an editor at a magazine owned by Condé Nast, which also owns Vogue. And if you've seen the movie The Devil Wears Prada or read the book, um, you get a sense of that sort of style of magazine and how the pace at which the magazine is run and um, the fanciness and the money that Condé Nast had to spend on their editors, and she tells some great stories about some very fancy travel. Um, and also talks a little bit about the editors at the other magazines. There's some good inside scoop story stories for from editors for Travel Magazine and Vogue Magazine. Um, but ultimately, she's telling the story through food and connecting people at her new workplace where she walks in as the new editor, having had no real experience um, in business and stands up in front of 65 people who now work for her and she has to find a common connection with them and the connection is food and that is what why I wanted to talk about food memoir today um, there's a new blog post up on our website um, it's a book list that I selected with some help from some co-workers and um, just looking around at what's popular right now and so I've collected some of the books that are up there and some other ones as I was browsing this morning at the library, I just grabbed some books that looked interesting. Um, I think food memoir is, um, if you like nonfiction and you like a narrative memoir, which is a sort of storytelling with an arc, you know, it has a beginning, something happens, something changes, it wraps itself up nicely, you meet characters along the way, um, and you also love to eat or to cook or just to like gro grocery shop and see the ingredients, you're a foodie, any of those things, food memoirs might be for you. Um, they often include recipes here and there. This Save Me the Plums has maybe like five recipes in it. There are some that have more recipes, um, but food is such a, a shared experience that we have. Um, we connect so many of our memories to food, to meals that we've had, to um, relationships, to dates that we've gone on for a meal, to groups of friends gathering for food, to dinner clubs, um, to dinner parties. We have so many strong memories around food and mealtime and friendships and all of the things that come with that. Thanksgiving dinners and holiday meals and decorating cookies with our with our families. I have very, very strong memories of decorating cookies with my mother when I was a child and my mother was a very strong foodie in her time and um, so many of my childhood stories when I think back at my fond memories they had to do with food, cooking in the kitchen with her and many of these people who write food memoirs have similar experiences. They were um, something about food captured them at a young age and it is just the focus of what they're writing about even if they're not chefs. Ruth Reichel is not a chef. Um, you know, Bill Buford is not a chef. Many of these people aren't. So, um, Save Me the Plums, and I have another one here by um, Ruth Reichel. It's called Tender to the Bone here. And another interesting thing, so this is a, this memoir by Ruth Reichel is a memoir of her early years as a child growing up. Um, she alludes to this in this book as well. Her mom had bipolar disorder. She was very, um, had very swaying and deep manic and depressive episodes and often Ruth 
didn't know what mother she was coming home to when she came home. She didn't know what mom she was waking up to. Her mom would have epic dinner parties and then shut herself into her room for days. And the dinner parties were the, were the things that Ruth captured and held on to as memories. And Ruth Reichel was an early reader at, of Gourmet Magazine. She had a subscription to Gourmet Magazine when she was eight years old. And it was sort of like this thing that was true in her life and that she could always come back to because her mother was so uh, unpredictable. And she felt that coming back to food and coming back to meals for her gave her some sense of stability in life. Um, in Tender to the Bone, she, she talks more about her relationship with her mom and the difficulties of um, growing up in a family with um, a parent with mental illness and also how she became um, sort of a caretaker for her family in, um, in taking care of the meals and taking on that role when her mom was not able to. Um, I'll go through the books that we have here and talk a little bit about them. I've read a couple of them. I haven't read a lot. There's a few that are on my list now that I have um, looked them up. This one I read a long time ago. It's called Heat by Bill Buford. Um, an amateur's adventures as a kitchen slave, line cook, pasta maker, and apprenticed, apprentice to a Dante quoting butcher in Tuscany, which is, in my opinion, the best part of the book, when Bill Buford who decides that he is um, completely enamored with Mario Batali, the now disgraced chef, Mario Batali, um, and wants to work for him in his kitchen doing absolutely the bottom rung of jobs there are. He goes on to work for Mario Batali for three years, apprenticing with him, and then he travels to Italy and also to England to work for um, hunters, a game hunter, and an Italian Tuscan butcher, who butchers in a very old-fashioned style, and they get into a lot of detail about it, but he just talks about how his appreciation for food became so much greater after experiencing uh, such an old style of cooking and um, learning skills from people who learned them um, in a very rural, rural way from their own parents and grandparents and um, take out sort of the, the American style of kitchen cooking. This, it, it turns into sort of like a very interesting tale of old style cooking. Um, another book I have here is Kitchen Confidential, which I have flipped through. I haven't read this whole book. It's Anthony Bourdain, um, who was a very um, larger-than-life uh, character, chef, traveler, writer, journalist, s storyteller, um, truth teller about his life. This uh, sort of is a behind the scenes of the restaurant business and the life the very insane life that he lived when he was um, when he was working um, in restaurants in New York and beyond. Um, he talks a lot about the things, stories in restaurants that we don't, we never hear, um, and talks a lot about his uh, fueled drug fueled existence um, in the after hours world of restaurants. Um, you know, the restaurant closes down at. 10 o'clock and we leave, but oftentimes the staff is there until the wee hours of the morning preparing for the next day, and he tells a lot of interesting stories um, about that. Uh, his passion for food started on a family trip he took to France. He actually, they took a um, ship across, he took a ship across with his mom to France, and he had uh, a couple of experiences there. One was a bowl of soup that was served cold, and that trans... It, it changed him forever because he had never thought that cold soup was a thing and he was fascinated by the idea that in the world people eat soup cold. And he also tried his first oyster um, in the north of France and he was um, captured by that experience as well and very in, it, his trip, first trip to France and subsequent trips informed his love for um, food and cooking and his lifestyle, I think, his lifestyle of good eating and good living. Um, this is one that I just grabbed off the shelf this morning, actually. I've read this book, and it's a great book. 
It's by David Leibovitz. He is a chef. Um, he used to work at Chez Panisse in Berkeley with Alice Waters, and he now lives in Paris. He's been in Paris for a long time, and he's written um, several books. Um, he has a blog, David, davidlebovitz.com, and he, his latest book is called Drinking French, um, in which he um, presents recipes for French cocktails, or cocktails that he has discovered or created while living in France. And during the quarantine, interestingly, um, on his Instagram page, every day at noon Eastern time, which is five o'clock Paris time, he, in his kitchen in Paris, would spend an hour um, making uh, one of his cocktails live from his Drinking French book. And um, sometimes he would pair it, he, his, he lives with his partner, Romain, and they would pair it with an appetizer or a light meal. Um, they ended up doing this, I think, for like 60 straight days. There are so many out great hours of cocktail making and French food making and tours of his kitchen um, to watch on his Instagram page. So if you love food or you know who he is and you like him, he, he's really fun to watch. Um, La Pau is his book that he wrote. It's his second most recent book. And it's about his uh, experience buying his first apartment in Paris. And you wonder, why is this a food memoir? I'll tell you, because he's a chef. And for a chef in Paris who loves food so much, everything, again, comes back to his experience with food. So the apartment hunting is hilarious. It's, it's not at all what um, it's like here in, uh, in the States or in Canada, where I'm from. Um, but he also sort of like every, every now and again, he will talk about, a st tell a story about finding an apartment or what he needs for his kitchen or what's wrong with the kitchen he's in. And then suddenly it just turns into a recipe because he's described something he ate or cooked or tried in a restaurant. And then before you know it, you're looking at a recipe for buckwheat chocolate chip cookies. And he's funny, um, and this book carries you to Paris. Um, many of his books do, his blog does as well. His blog, he takes beautiful pictures of shops and food shops in Paris and antique shops in Paris. And um, he's really enjoyable, and uh, it's fun to watch him and Romain on Instagram together because Romain does not speak much English, and David does speak French, but Romain teases him about his French, and so they go back and forth with um, the French and English, and they're very cute. Um, so that was called La Pâte, La Pâte. Another book that I haven't read, but I've heard so much about, and I would like to read it. We have the CD um, audiobook in the library right now. It's called uh, Bones, Blood, Bones, and Butter by Gabrielle Hamilton. Gabrielle Hamilt Hamilton is the owner of Prune, a restaurant in New York, which is very popular. It's in the village, I think, East Village. Um, she's not a chef. She came to become a restaurant owner having no chef experience, um, just someone who loves food. She's a food writer. She's an MFA. She wrote, has written from every Epicurean magazine and newspaper, um, food, food um, section. So she tells her story um, in memoir style from her childhood, which was um, not enjoyable. Her parents got divorced. She didn't really have a calling in life. She didn't know what to do with herself. She dabbled in odd jobs. She worked in some restaurants. She um, she stole some money once and from a, from a, she, um, created a fraudulent check, I think, from a coworker. Um, and then she decided to um, go to school, become a food writer, and then became so fascinated she wanted to open a restaurant. And she did, and it was a great success, and the book has a happy ending, um, but she's, it's a fun story. So that's a good one, Blood, Bones, and Butter. And all of these books that I have are belong to our library, except for um, the first one I showed you that I saved me the plums, that's mine. But we do have one here, I saw it uh, last week when I was here. So if you want to put any of these on hold, you can. I'm going to put them back on the shelf when I'm done. 
Um, another one that I, I thought was neat, I haven't read this, but I'd like to. It's called What She Ate by Laura Shapiro. And Laura Shapiro is a, is a um, culinary historian. She writes about the history of food. And in that vein, she's written this book, uh, What She Ate, that talks about six women and the um, role that food played in their lives, which you wouldn't really even think is a thing again, but if you love, like to read food memoir, this, that will totally make sense to you. So she selected some women, for example, um, Dorothy, um, Dorothy Wordsworth, William Wordsworth's sister, who was also a poet and a writer. Um, Dorothy loved to cook. She loved to cook for her brother. She cared for him after their parents died. And um, it talks about her, uh, the role that food played in their life. Um, Rosa Lewis, who was a servant in um, England, a Cockney servant, who turned herself into um, a caterer, opened a catering business, and was the preferred caterer of royalty in England, um, King Edward, I think. Um, and then there's also Eva Braun, Hitler's uh, wife, Adolf Hitler's wife. She talks about her as well and the bizarre roles that relationship that Eva Braun had with uh, food. So that's an interesting book. I think the, um, the history of this book would be really make it very interesting. So that's Laura Shapiro. This, and this one, I think that this, my co colleague Jenny might have been the one who recommended this one. I can't remember. Um, there was another one about being in the kitchen with an eggplant that she did, but we didn't have that book here. So this is called How to Cook a Moose by Kate Christensen. And that's not like code for anything. It's actually How to Cook a Moose. Kate Christensen is from New York City, and she met a man and fell in love, and they moved together to New Hampshire, where he, I think, was from. They ultimately ended up in Maine, but she was not sure she would be interested in moving from a big city to a small town and leaving fancy restaurants and her friends and her social life. Um, but she really found her stride living in the country. Um, they became sort of homesteaders and big uh, farmers market people and foragers for mushrooms and when she would make trips into Maine and she decided at some point she wanted to um, try to make and perfect um, the uh, moose muffle stew. I had to look that up. I think it's called moose muffle stew. It's not called moose muzzle stew. Even though it's made, it's actually made with the sort of like snout of the moose. I could never eat a moose. I'm from Canada. And that would be like eating a puppy. I, I, don't, I don't even know. And if you're from Maine or you've ever heard of this, please chime in. I'm curious. Anyway, she, um, she's funny. It's light. Um, it's available. And I think it could be interesting. And there's an actual recipe in here for the moose stew, too. So there's se several recipes. I mean, she's got some potato salad. You know, it's, it's again, um, things she finds and things she grows and then recipes to use them. So it's just kind of peppered with um, recipes as a good food memoir should be. All right. Maybe the last one. Um, Eric Repair is a French chef. He's a Michelin French chef. If I'm not mistaken, I think he has three Michelin stars, countless Michelin stars. Um, he uh, has written this, he's written many books, but this memoir is called 32 Yokes, and it's about his childhood growing up um, in France, and then going from, he calls it his mother's table, to working the line, so working the line in a restaurant. Um, he's an interesting guy. He's... Um, he is a philanthropist as well. He's got um, he's he's got an interesting life. He, he didn't have a very happy childhood, but he's made a name of himself. He his parents got divorced. He was sent to boarding school. His father died 
on a hiking trip. None of these are spoilers. Um, and he ultimately, by watching his grandmother cook, and became, became obsessed with food, which is, I think, there's a, a bit of a theme with the, the loss of um, childhood and innocence and sta sta stability in parenthood, where kids turn to food as a way to um, soothe their soul, which I think a lot of us do, right? I do. I love to cook. I love to make bread. I made bread yesterday from my first sourdough starter, and I have to tell you, it was an absolute disaster. I grew my starter for two weeks, and everything looked perfect, and my bread came out like a big, flat brick. So, I don't know what to say about that. I should, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll read some bread books next. Anyway, we're almost out of time. Can you believe that? So, I hope you've enjoyed this light talk about food memoir. Maybe food memoirs are something that you'll think of, um, you'll think of reading. If you, if you just enjoy food, um, enjoy the rest, the restaurant side of restaurant business, the back, the back end side. Um, chefs talking about other chefs. It's a little bit gossipy, especially in the Anthony Bourdain books, and a little bit in this Bill Buford book as well. Um, it's kind of fun. So I'm going to just check into our calendar to see what's coming this week. Um, I'll be back again next week at 10 o'clock on Monday morning. So I hope you will join me. Hello. And um, this week coming up, we've got uh, some tech, a tech drop-in session, organizing your inbox drop-in session. That's tomorrow at 11. Um, library tech drop-in se session Wednesday at 2.30. Um, you can take a virtual session on organizing your digital photos, which uh, is pretty handy. That's um, Thursday at 1. And then uh, we have a teens, a virtual teen event with Amanda, our teen librarian. It's called Bring Your Own Book. You can register for that one online at winpublib.org. Um, and then coming up this month, we have some teen game nights, uh, recycled art night, um, some more tech stuff, like all kinds of really interesting tech things. I think organizing your inbox is one that mm, I should probably just take my boss teaches it and I think I would probably find it pretty handy um, and then of course on Friday the 31st of June July July um, we have Harry Potter trivia virtual Harry Potter, Potter trivia so check that out um, winpublive.org thanks for joining me for all booked podcast for all booked live stream and uh, I'll see you again next Monday keep reading